Uh, my name is Nick Searles from the team here at Bicycle Network. And yeah, thank you for joining us in the latest uh, edition of our Know Your Rights webinar series, a little series we put together to try and uh, help bike riders understand their rights while, uh, while riding on the roads and also just to help uh, generate a, a more safe environment for everybody uh, who shares our roads. So tonight, um, the topic of this webinar is Bicycle Network's Crash Experience Survey Review. As I mentioned, my name is Nick Searles uh, from the team of Bicycle Network and joining us to as panellists tonight is uh, Dr. Nicholas Hunter from Bicycle Network's research and policy team. Uh, Nick put together the survey and has sort of been the uh, mastermind behind this data. So Nick will present some of the results from the, uh, from the Crash Experience Survey, which many of our attendees may be familiar with. But I'll let Nick go into more details about the, uh, the survey and the data shortly. And then joining us also from Morris Blackburn is Natalie Fleming, who's a senior associate at Morris Blackburn. And Natalie will be discussing uh, some of the common law support for personal injury associated with, uh, with the crashes that we'll be investigating today, as well as options to pursue drivers for property damage and entitlements uh, for when drivers can be identified and sort of the legal side of, um, of the unfortunate experiences of a crash. And then finally joining us today is Damien Stewart from Room 23 Psychology and the College of Sports Psychologists. And, uh, and Damien's going to graciously go through some of the general psychological principles associated with, uh, with having a crash on your bike and explaining how they can be applied to help a rider who has been involved in a crash get back on their bike and find their feet. So, so yeah, Natalie will be sort of tackling the, the legal side of things and, and Damien's going to be tackling the, um, the psychological side of things after, after our very own Dr. Nick Hunter goes through all of the data. So um, without further ado, I think I'll pass over the presenting duties now to Dr. Nic Dr. Nicholas Hunter from Bicycle Network to uh, go through some of the stats from our bike crash experience study. Thanks, Nick. Oh, sorry, but, sorry, before you start, I should have just said uh, to the attendees, if you do have any questions throughout the uh, presentation, feel free to just pop them in the chat and um, the presentation, will the whole uh, webinar tonight will probably go for about one hour and we'll try and leave some time at the end to uh, discuss some of the questions afterwards. Um, apologies in advance if we don't get to all the questions. I'll, I'll be monitoring them if you put them in the chat and then I can direct the questions at the end uh, to our panelists and we can have a bit of a discussion. So, sorry, that was a little bit of housekeeping that I forgot, but now I'll hand over to, to Nick Hunter. No worries, from one Nick to another. Um, just bear with me one quick tick while I get my slides up. All righty, can everyone see that okay? Can I get a thumbs up? Fantastic. All right. Um, well, yes, uh, thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, I'm very happy to be presenting uh, the findings from this bike crash experience study. Uh, effectively, what I'm going to be showing you is what I've been working on over the past several months, uh, looking at people's bike crash experiences and trying to understand some of the characteristics associated with that crash, not, uh, not just the, uh, the, the general where and when and why, but also the experiences that people have had with their crashes. Uh, uh, things like the uh, barriers to riding, um, financial burdens, um, any long-term physical and mental health outcomes, some of the things that we don't really know about but should know about um, as we try and uh, improve rider welfare into the future. Uh, I'm quite cognizant that people uh, in the audience today uh, have um, probably fulfilled uh, the survey that has informed the study and to which I humbly thank you for doing so. Um, it's with uh, your contributions that we're able to uh, make positive change in this general bike rider space. So thank you so much. Um, I'm also would like to just quickly say, obviously, this is a very negative uh, type of issue. Um, I imagine a lot of people in the audience have probably had a crash. It's not the nicest of things. So obviously, a, a level of discretion is advised as we go through these findings. Uh, if you need to um, put me on mute and go and have a cup of tea, uh, take it easy out there. Um, without further ado, let's set the scene. Right. So what do we know about bike crashes uh, at the moment? Well, we know that the injury risks 
from a crash are disproportionately higher for people riding the bikes. This makes absolute sense. We don't have a protective shell or seat belts or airbags like we do in a car. We are very much by definition vulnerable road users. So the prevalence of injury and the seriousness of those injuries uh, are disproportionately higher for people riding bikes. Um, we also know that crashes do discourage people from riding a bike, not, um, not just right after a crash, but also uh, you're trying it for the first time. We know that in Victoria, for example, 75% of people are what we call interested but concerned when it comes to riding. They want to give bike riding a go, but they're uh, concerned about their safety. So there are a lot of barriers to for people getting on a bike and crashes are one of those barriers. We also know that unfortunately, bike injuries and fatalities have been on the rise uh, since 2016. So the data that you're looking at in this plot here, I'm assuming you can see my mouse, uh, is the year on year fatality data um, from 2016 to 2020. And you can see that it's gently rising um, along that timeline. And if we pick apart those uh, crashes in terms of what type of crash they are, specifically if they're rider vehicle crashes involving a collision with a vehicle, or rider-only crashes, we can see that it's the rider vehicle crashes that are rising um, as the years progress. Okay, now this rise means that we're not really on track to achieving uh, vision zero uh, by 2050, which is obviously trying to reduce uh, the road deaths to zero by 2050. In fact, if we follow this general trend into the future, we're certainly not going towards vision zero, we're actually going into you know, fatalities in the hundreds year on year. So we really do need to start taking action uh, right now. So that's just the general idea of what we do know around bike crashes, there, but there are things that we don't know. And that's what's uh, the motivators for this study. Uh, one of the things that we don't know is quite frankly, the diverse range of bike crashes and their characteristics. And the reason we don't really have a full idea about the wider range of crashes is because the data that we have at the moment is, is pretty underrepresentative of what's actually happening out there. So a lot of our data is uh, mainly police records or hospital records. Um, this is where we collate most of our bike crash statistics. And you can understand and probably intuit that not everyone is going to present at a hospital following a crash and not everyone is going to report uh, their crash to the police. So this is... Uh, really a partial window into uh, the wider range of crashes. There's, there's most likely a lot of unknown crashes and unknown unknown factors uh, out there pertaining to crashes. And so we need other mechanisms uh, to grab crash data and try and learn more about uh, the wider range. And again, this is a motivator for what we're doing here. The other thing that we don't know, as I sort of mentioned at the start, is people's personal experiences in a crash. So obviously a crash is more than a statistic, it's more than a number. There are obviously many different experiential uh, facets to it, including uh, the financial burden that people have, the long-term mental, mental, physical and psychosocial health outcomes that come after a crash. And of course, barriers to riding. How long does it take for people to get back on a bike? What are the, uh, the motivations for getting back on a bike or the, or the barriers that stop people from getting back on the bike after their crash? So it's these type of experiences that we don't really have a good understanding of and we really do need to understand. And so those two facets are effectively what have motivated this talk. We wanted to understand the wider range of crashes and we wanted to understand people's experiences. And that's why we've gone down this path of creating a survey uh, that we can tap, so we can tap into the bike crash community and let them uh, tell us their stories about, uh, about bike crashes that they've had. So there were effectively two uh, mechanisms by which we collected data for this, uh, for this study. Uh, as I mentioned, we've done a survey. So that survey went out to, uh, to members, to our followers on social media, to bike user groups, uh, and a number of different other mechanisms. And we also use our crash reporter tool, which is a, a portal on the Bicycle Network website that people can use to give characteristics of their crash to inform or advise, I should say, on um, for insurance purposes. So these two uh, data sets were compiled together and through that we were able to collect just over 1100 crash experiences uh, that we could uh, analyze and try and understand some of the common uh, characteristics of crashes. 
So before I jump into what we found, I'll just give you a quick little uh, profile of the, uh, the respondents. Um, so we didn't ask any, uh, any demographic questions. So in terms of uh, age, uh, gender identity and so forth, we we're more concentrated on bike riding behaviors. So we asked people about how long they had been riding, for example, we found that the majority of people had been riding for 20 plus years. So a quite experienced, uh, a quite experienced cohort of riders. We asked about trip purpose, uh, you know, what the, the main purpose of riding was. And as you could probably imagine, it was one of the two. It was uh, recreational riding was obviously like one of the big ones, over 50% or nearly 50%. Uh, and, and getting around, um, you know, commuting and so forth. The transport purposes were the other one. That was the, they were the main reasons for riding a bike. In terms of the time spent on the road, the travel time, it do, uh, does differ between uh, the, the type of trip purpose. So for, for transport, for commuting around, obviously it's a, a little bit of a, it's usually a shorter amount of time, obviously or a run off to work or something like that. So it's between 10 and 50 minutes. And then for uh, recreational rides, obviously a little bit longer, you can be up to two hours, so making, a, making a day of it going off uh, on a trip for uh, several hours or so. So generally there's a, there's a difference in the travel time um, that people are out on the road, depending on what they're doing. Um, we, we generally asked about people's uh, safety and maintenance behaviours, um, just to get an idea of uh, the, the level of um, the level of maintenance that they they um, they apply to their bike and the sort of um, safety practices that they employ. Um, yeah, when it comes to running a bike. We generally found that people always wear a helmet, makes sense in Victoria because we have mandatory laws. Um, they regularly wear high visibility clothing and uh, in most cases, people have a, a, front, uh, a light on the, the front and back of their bike. Uh, in terms of maintenance, uh, people will check their tyre pressure and uh, brakes before each trip. Uh, they do a monthly brake pad check and uh, they'll get their bike serviced annually. So generally pretty good when it comes to safety and maintenance. Cool. All right. So what we'll do here is we'll do a, a bit of a high level look um, at what crashes look like, the where's, the when's and so forth. And then we'll delve a little bit deeper with specific types of, of bike crash. So in terms of when crashes occur, you can see uh, in terms of time of year, generally not much variation uh, across the months. Uh, it's pretty stable. However, with the time of day, there certainly is some, uh, some, some higher frequency periods where crashes are more likely. And it is, as you probably imagine, in that morning peak period between 6 a.m. and 9, uh, 9 a.m., you can see that there's a higher frequency of crashes during that time. And also uh, towards the evening uh, at 5 p.m., these are obviously the times where people are traveling uh, to and from work, school, uh, university, uh, and what have you. Uh, in terms of the uh, the weekend weekday split, it's about 75% of crashes occur on the weekday and 25% occur uh, on the weekend. Now we generally know uh, these uh, these types of data, and we know this from looking at uh, fatal road crash data, which I've just overlaid here. So this green line that I've just added to these plots, this is the um, the fatal road crash data for the same uh, survey period, which is between 2016-2020, and you can see that it's pretty consistent uh, with what we found with our own crash data, particularly for the time of day, we see that uh, peak periods uh, in the morning and in the evening, again, when people are traveling to and from work, most likely. And you can see the split between um, weekday and weekends is pretty similar for um, yeah, fatal uh, bike crash. Uh, bike crashes, pretty similar to what we found. And I show these here just to imply that the, the sample uh, data that we've collected reasonably representative of, of what we see, uh, consistent with what we see with, our, with the bike fatality data and therefore hopefully quite representative um, of what's happening out in the real world across the population. Okay, so that's when crashes occur. In terms of where crashes occur, we asked a couple of questions of the respondents, uh, specifically where uh, whereabouts the, uh, the crash happened, if it was in the metro region, if it was regional, or if it was in a more remote area. Uh, the type of infrastructure, so whether it happened on a road, uh, a footpath, an intersection, a shared path, and what have you. And um, Perhaps most importantly, were there any bike facilities uh, at that location? Was there a protected bike lane? Was there a painted bike lane? Was there any bike lane markings at all? And what we found, if I can just simplify these, uh, these pie charts here, we found that in the majority of crashes, most of them occurred in the metropolitan area on a road and more than often there were no bike lanes. And um, that's probably not much of a surprise, I'd say. 
All right. Now, in terms of what happened after the crash, one of the, the pertinent questions that we're asking here is, did people go and visit a hospital afterwards? Because again, going back to the context of the study, we know that hospital records is one of the primary places in which we get our, uh, our crash statistics from. Now, here I've magically put our data into uh, 100 people. And you can see that if we think about it in this way, less than half of the respondents actually visited the hospital after their crash. So just under 50% of people that uh, responded to the survey actually visited the hospital. And I think we need to just spend a little bit of extra time on that because as I said, we started the talk saying that hospital records and police records were the primary sources for our crash statistics. So these are the, these are the, the data sets that we're using to inform our strategies, our policies and our advocacy. But we're seeing here that for every person that goes to the hospital, another person doesn't. So this, what we, the, the hospital records we have are kind of only telling us half the story about what's actually happening in terms of crashes in the real world. So this is pretty important. And so what are the experiences amongst these people that aren't represented in our uh, crash statistics that didn't visit a hospital? We can see some of the experiences here on the screen. You can see that people have needed physio, they'd struggled to afford it, their bike was written off, there's loss of employment, um, there's a general hesitation about returning to the intersection where the crash happened. There are a lot of negative experiences amongst this cohort of people that unfortunately we don't have data for, widely speaking. Okay, so one of the, one of the uh, elements of our crash report at all is to uh, get a sense of what sort of costs were incurred uh, with respect to the crash uh, that happened. And what we found through looking at that data is that the average amount uh, amongst the, the crashes, the costs incurred from a crash was just over $3,000. So this, uh, there's a number of different um, pools of costs here. So we're talking about things like ambulance costs, um, transport to and from hospitals and from the crash site, obviously the, the repair of equipment, um, post-medical costs, so visiting the doctor after the crash. Um, but the big one um, was the loss of earnings, that people have to take time off work. So in some cases, they lose their employment because they just can't work because of physical ailments, for example. So you can see some of the experiences pertaining to um, some of the financial burdens here. And I should say that any of these, um, any of these responses on the screen will be um, part of the eventual report that we will put together. So we will go into a lot of detail with um, listing out these experiences. But you can see that there are a lot of negative consequences that come um, under the banner of financial burden, unfortunately. Okay, um, so in the next couple of slides, I'm just gonna dig a little bit deeper into two types of crash that are quite frequent uh, amongst the data set. Um, and that is uh, most obviously the uh, rider only crashes. So the crashes that occur that just where just the rider is involved and rider vehicle crashes. So where there's been a, a collision with a vehicle as part of that crash. Because as you can see, there are over 75% of the crashes that uh, uh, respondents raise with us were one of those two as you can see there. So uh, what we'll do now is we'll start with the rider only crashes and just do like a, a bit of a, a digger deep uh, into those types of crash. So at a, at a broad level, they are quite similar to other types of crashes. So they mostly happen on weekdays. Uh, they mostly happen, you know, they occur throughout the year. There isn't much um, variation throughout the year. And um, as we've seen, only half uh, of people visited a hospital with these types of crash. But there are some ways in which they are different. And I wanna draw your attention here specifically to uh, the locations at which they occur. So if I can explain this plot here, what we're looking at is the frequency of rider only crashes compared to other types of crashes. So if we're seeing a green arrow over this side, it means that it's happening more frequently than other types of crash, okay? So generally what we find with rider only crashes is that they're less frequent on, on roads, and therefore we're seeing a red arrow, so less frequency. They're more frequent uh, on uh, shared paths, which makes sense, you're going off on a, a leisurely stroll by yourself and you unfortunately fall over on a shared path. Um, and they're less frequent at intersections. So there's certainly places where it's more likely that a rider only crash will happen compared to other types of, of bike crash. We also found that they're more frequent uh, amongst uh, people who use their bike for recreation. So we can see a high proportion of people uh, that experienced the rider only crash were, uh, were taking a, uh, were, were riding for the purposes of recreation. 
So they're more common for, for recreational rides rather than transport uh, related rides or, or other types of rides. And here are some of the, uh, the experiences that we collected uh, pertaining to rider only crashes. And if we sort of lump these into types of themes, I think the general consistent theme that we see is that there's generally some type of third party or foreign object associated with that rider only crash. So a lot of people raised um, uh, experiences regarding tram lines, for example, uh, potholes, layers of mud, um, rocks dislodged from the escarpment on the side of the road. So you can see that typically there's some foreign object that, that is involved with these rider only crashes. That was a common theme. And that's something that we do see also in, in the, the peer reviewed literature as well. So that's quite a consistent um, observation. All right, so that's a general overview of the rider only crashes. Now we'll move on to the, uh, the rider vehicle crashes. So again, we do see some common themes and most happen on the weekdays that occur throughout the year. And again, unfortunately only half do visit a hospital after their crash, but there are some ways in which they are distinct. So perhaps unexpectedly, the rider vehicle crashes do have a lot of these uh, occur uh, with people that are using their bike for transport. So they're out on the road, uh, you know, running from home, they're obviously sharing the road with a lot of uh, high density traffic. So the likelihood for uh, experiencing a rider vehicle crash is obviously a lot higher. So there is a general tendency to, um, to have a, a rider vehicle crash during a, um, a transport related trip. Now, in terms of reporting to police, obviously in this case, we have a, another party involved. So uh, the, the likelihood of reporting to police is obviously gonna be a little bit higher. However, we did find, uh, like the hospital records, that amongst respondents who experienced the crash with a motor vehicle, again, only half of them reported that crash to the police. So if I can use the same messaging as before, you know, for every one person that reported the police, another person didn't. So we only have a partial window into the wider range of rider vehicle crashes, unfortunately. And again, this shows the importance of, of reaching out to the community to understand um, uh, their bike crash experiences. And uh, this is one of the more unfortunate uh, outcomes that we found. We found that one in four vehicle crashes involves some form of hit and run. We found that you know 25% of, of respondents had experienced that a hit and run type of characteristic as part of their wider vehicle crash. And we also found amongst the amongst that cohort that most of them occurred where there were no bike lane markings. So, so the lack of bike lane markings on the road was a, it was potentially a determinant for, for that type of crash. And also among the people that were involved in a hit, and so the 25% the, the um, of all Bruce correspondents, only 60% of them reported their crash to the police. So not only were 25% of these crashes potentially a crime, a further 60% of that cohort were potential crimes that the police didn't really know about. So there is, Unfortunately, quite a, uh, quite a shortcoming uh, when it comes to um, understanding hit and run style crashes. Okay, and here's just a breakdown of some of the experiences um, related uh, to hit and run uh, style crashes that we found. And again, these will all go into the report where um, people can uh, look at it in a bit more detail um, at the type of experiences that people have had. All right, uh, just, this, just to wrap up of some of the other feedback we had, I mean, we obviously got a lot of detail um, from the various respondents about um, the characteristics of, um, of their bike crash. Um, and so I've just sort of uh, loosely labeled some of those here, but they generally fall into some very distinct themes. Um, the first one being psychological impacts and barriers to riding. We did hear a lot about people's uh, being discouraged from getting on their bike again and having issues with, um, with getting back, uh, not on their bike uh, in, in some cases, but also just going back to the, the, the intersection or the scene where the crash happened. Um, we did hear a lot uh, regarding long-term negative health outcomes. So obviously a crash doesn't happen. At, uh, it's, it's not like a, a, a point-based incident. It's something that uh, you know, has long-term ramifications and people went into a lot of detail um, about some of the negative impacts that they, uh, they were experiencing over the long-term. Uh, but one of the things um, that was hopefully will be useful in terms of um, advocacy going forward is at the very end of the, uh, the survey, we asked people to give us additional feedback 
uh, about uh, possible thoughts around how they think risks could be mitigated into the future. And so we compiled these um, into a number of themes. And what you're looking at here on the right hand side is uh, the, the size of the word is effectively how frequent uh, it came up. And you can see that there are two key themes that came up against with people's responses in, in terms of what should be, um, what we should act on in the future. And it turned out that that was driver education and protected lanes. And I think that that's quite important that we are listening to uh, the people that have had these experiences and what they think is going to keep them safe into the future. And so this is going to be a, um, hopefully, you know, quite, quite an integral part of, of our reporting. Cool. Okay, so I'm just going to quickly wrap it up because I'm conscious of uh, not taking up too much of the time. Um, so what we found was Unfortunately, only half of people have uh, presented at a hospital, so they only have half a view of what's actually happening out in the uh, out in the real world. Um, half of respondents have followed their crash beliefs. Similarly, where crashes involved a car, one in four were hit and runs. Pretty uh, unfortunate consequence. Uh, bike crashes involve significant financial burdens, um, as we've shown, and unfortunately, non long term negative health outcomes. Um, the majority of crashes occurred where there were no bike lane markings. Uh, many of the rider only clashes typically had some sort of obstruction, uh, such as tram tracks, loose objects, uh, and so forth. And we found, as I showed you at the start, that uh, you know, generally speaking, a lot of people were pretty good when it came to safety and maintenance of their bikes. So there's only so far in which we can really put this back on the, the victims of the crash. All right, so from our end, um, Basically, we're putting together this report. Um, I can't say too much at this stage about uh, what we're doing in terms of our policy and strategic direction. Um, it's still quite early days and it does, uh, there will be some sort of carefully picking apart um, the, the data and what it's trying to tell us. Um, but I can say that we are putting together this report. Um, we will uh, be communicating the findings as best we can. Um, and we're, we're certainly open to uh, getting questions, um, getting comments. Um, so by all means, please stay in touch with us. Um, I'm going to end it there for now. Thank you so much for your time. And thank you again for anyone that participated in the survey that's informed the study. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, as I warned you guys, Nick is the data master and he's very carefully um, sort of put this together and combed through those details with some really interesting insights there. So thank you for that, Nick. Um, uh, just a reminder, if you do have any questions again, you can, uh, as the pres presentations go on, you can just pop them in the Q&A section at the bottom and, uh, and we can filter through those at the end. But I think uh, Nick did a very good job at covering all of my questions in that presentation. Um, so I'll now hand over to Natalie Fleming from our partner uh, law firm at Morris Blackburn. Um, take it away, Nat. Thanks, everyone. I'll just bring up and share my screen and then we can get started. Okay, is that shared? Everyone can see that? Yep. Yes. Okay, great. Hi, look, my name's Natalie Fleming. I'm a senior associate in the road transport area of Morris Blackburn in the Melbourne office. And I work with Bicycle Network to provide assistance on their property damage uh, program. Uh, we, have, uh, and we have myself and five other solicitors assisting to provide uh, support for cyclists who've uh, had their property damaged through an accident with a vehicle. Um, I, or as part of a road, I also provide assistance to bicycle network members uh, in relation to any injuries claims they may have and to assist them with any issues they may be having with the TAC or even to convince them to put in a claim with the TAC. Uh, in addition, we also have a separate team who have spoken to you in the past, uh, run by Demi Ayanu, who run the public liability aspects of those injuries claims, where if something in the road has caused the injury, et cetera, you can make that type of claim. In addition, we advocate for riders' rights, and we have recently had some success in changing the legislation but I'll bring that to you in another webinar into the future. Um, but that's just a taster for the future. But that's what we do is we advocate very strongly for riders. And through our, um, through our team, we advocate for change to legislation to protect riders on the roads. So tonight, what I wanted to do, because I think in March 2021, I did a presentation where I really went through the TAC scheme in quite a lot of detail. I wanted to follow up on uh, Nick's research and talk about 
Um, property damage, injuries and unidentified vehicles. It's horrifying to me to think that only 50% of people are in an accident report it to police and that there are so many people out there funding their own private uh, medical expenses when that can be funded as part of a TAC claim. So um, on that note, I'll just start bringing up some different slides. So what is the TAC and what does it do? It's a state-based insurer, effectively the TAC. So it's there to protect you if you're injured in a transport accident. And that's an accident that involves a train, a tram, a bus, a vehicle, a motorbike. Um, it doesn't cover bike on bike accidents, but it covers all of the other vehicle accidents. And basically in order to get into that scheme, you need to make a claim. So if you're injured in a transport accident while riding your bike, you need to make a claim. And in order to make a claim for either an injuries claim or a property damage claim, you'll need some evidence. And some of the evidence that's needed, quite often Bicycle Network members are very, very good at providing that evidence. But when I see uh, Nick's research, it's obvious that um, some of you aren't actually speaking up and actually going to the doctor or going to hospital or talking to the police about the fact that you've had an accident and then putting in a claim. So for both, there are uh, forms of evidence that are required to be successful. And I know this is difficult because we're a vulnerable road user, cyclists, and when we do get injured or knocked to, to the road, we have, you know, if we have an accident, it's not just a bingo like we would have in a car. It, it, we're vulnerable. We're more likely to suffer uh, significant injuries. But just a few tips and practical ideas. If you are in an accident, once you've established your safety, you need to attempt to do the following. And it may not always be possible. I'm very aware of that. But if a vehicle caused the accident, you need to get the details of that vehicle, whether you take a photo of the uh, of the number plate, whether you get uh, a witness to take the details for you and get the witness's number, whether you speak to the driver. So if you can take photos or jot down the registration number of the vehicles involved, talk to the witnesses again if you can and get the contact details of those witnesses because those witnesses can be absolutely vital to enable us to establish liability at that, the scene of that accident. So in, that, in regards to that, those are the, the key tips in relation to early stage evidence. And then if, if you're making a property damage claim, you need to take photos of the damage to your bike and the vehicle that caused the incident and accident. So those photos don't just go off and get your bike repaired. Um, those photos need to be taken before you get the bike repaired and they need to be close up clear photos of the bike and the damage to it. Um, you also need to, um, and I'll come back to this as well, but getting a bike tech report if, you, if you're trying to claim property damage, but I'll come back to that. So don't get rid of your bike, don't um, and buy a new bike before you've taken those photos. Um, make sure you've got a you know, clear copy of the serial number that you can prove ownership and that you have photos of the actual damage to the bike. If you're injured or if you're not injured and the police do not attend, you'll you'll need to make a report to the police. Now this can be helpful from um, an insurance point of view when you're making a property damage claim. It creates, it creates weight to that claim if you've told the police about it. In a ten, and, and you need to do that by attending the local police station in person. If you're injured, it's generally a prerequisite to a claim that you make a report to the police. So this needs to be done. And again, I think it was um, one out of two are not, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Nick, um, one out of two people are not reporting to police. I think that's really important from a statistical point of view. And also to, if it's happening locally and the police are getting continual reports of this area being a problem, they will take particular notice of what the issues are there. So all of that reporting, although it may not assist you, it will assist riders in the future. And I think that's really, really important. Um, and you also need proof that you've been injured as well. So if you're going to make an injuries claim, it's not also it's not just about establishing whether the accident happened by you know reporting to police, but it's also about establishing that you've suffered an injury. Now that's as simple as going to your doctor and saying, look, my neck's been sore since Thursday when I was injured when someone cleaned me up at an intersection. But it can also um, it is needed because even though most of those injuries will you will recover from, if say you don't do anything about it for six weeks and then you go and report it, it is 
much more likely that the TAC will balk at accepting that claim. They want that baseline initial evidence that says this happened and then I was injured. So that's what they want. They want a clear connection between it. They don't want evidence six months old because it's very hard for them as an insurer. Well, it's very easy for them as an insurer to say, well, there could have been a series of intervening events that caused that injury. We don't have a contemporaneous report on it. So going, if, if you don't go to hospital, go to your doctor and report it. It's as simple as just saying, I was, you know, this happened and I'm now sore here. It might be that you have trouble with that injury down the track. And if you haven't reported it, it's impossible to get a claim through. Uh, the other thing too, which Bicycle Network members are very good with generally is um, CCTV footage or having footage that they take themselves on their bike. But if you're unable to identify the vehicle or the driver of the vehicle, go back if you can bear it to the scene of the accident, knock on doors, check that someone didn't see the accident and didn't actually come out to help you. you know, sometimes <clears throat> people will hear an accident, <coughs> excuse me, and they'll come out realise you're being assisted and uh, not, not, not actually come over and, and add themselves to the witness list. However, knock on their door, see if they're around, see if they saw things, what did they see, see if they've got security cameras on their property, a local business might have CCTV footage, etc. So there's a fair amount of that available now, but it generally needs to be uh, collected fairly early after the transport accident. Okay. So in relation to property damage, that collection of evidence, if we start by looking at property damage first, that collection of evidence will assist you to um, make an actual claim. And I actually have put property damage before injuries, which is unusual, but can I just say, bicycle network members and cyclists in general tend to get very upset when their bikes are damaged. We love our bikes and quite often, I can't convince someone to make an injuries claim until I've got the money for their bike for them. So uh, for example, um, one of the examples I had was a, um, a guy who was hit from behind at 80 k's an hour by a van. It was a very clear, um, very clear liability there. He was hit from behind and ended up having to have a five level spinal fusion. And he rang me about property damage. <laughs> and was telling me about the accident and he'd been referred to us by Bicycle Network. And I said to him, you know, that's a terrible injury. Like you have got a very clear claim there. And he said, oh no, I'll just get my bike, thanks. So we did have a good success with him in that because, uh, because the injuries were severe, when the insurer made the initial offer of $2,500 on a $5,000 bike, but that was about an appropriate um, depreciation gauge. He said to me, look, can you get a bit more? So we ended up getting him about four because we pressured the insurer over the injuries and said, you know, it was an unacceptable result considering what happened. It wasn't until after that that he was able to <clears throat> talk to me about his injuries. And that's not uncommon. <coughs> Excuse me. So property damage, the support we provide to Bicycle Network members is that I, my understanding is Bicycle Network provide a pro forma letter that members can use and that they uh, send that off to make a demand. If that demand's not met, they're referred to us, our team of five, and we then get on and provide assistance with that claim. And this assistance includes letters of demand, chasing reluctant insurers <clears throat> who are dragging their feet and reluctant defendants. Excuse me for one sec. It is surprising to me always how quickly insurers uh, respond once you've got a lawyer's letterhead. But we can't do much unless we've got real evidence of the damage and um, a police report's been made and we have uh, an understanding of who the defendant is. Now, with an injuries claim, we provide support to Bicycle Network members uh, with putting in the claim to the TAC. You have 12 months to put in a claim after you have been injured. The uh, TAC will have the discretion to accept the claim for up to three years. However, 12 months, <coughs> excuse me for coughing, 12 months is the 
standard date. And if you do go over 12 months and up to three years, you do need to provide reasons for the delay. Now, as I said before, a tram, a train, a bus or a car must have caused the injury. You must have reported an injury and you must have reported the accident to the police. <coughs> so once the claim is accepted by the TAC, sorry for my throat sticking. Once the claim is accepted by the TAC, you'll be eligible for payment of medical expenses that are reasonable and related to the transport accident. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> those medical expenses that people are reporting to Nick that are not being paid for, they should be paid for by the TAC. No one should be out of pocket. If they're injured on the roads, that's what the TAC is there for. Again, loss of earnings are available. If you are injured on the roads, you have 18 months of loss of earnings and then 18 months of loss of earnings capacity payments that can be claimed. These are important payments and they do help people move on. Certainly getting the support for the injuries help people move on and getting the um, loss of earnings, you know, take away the worry of not being able to pay your way while you recover. Very, very important. And then from my perspective, I jump in when there is <clears throat> a possible permanent impairment. So if you're injured and that injury is going to cause an ongoing impairment, I can also assist you with that. And the second claim, sorry about my weird voice. The second claim <clears throat> is for serious injury and common law damages. This is for pain and suffering and economic loss. So the guy that the guy that I um, assisted with the spinal fusion, he, um, he once his property damage was resolved, we got into a stoush with the TAC about his injuries because he did recover well. We got him $350,000. Now he'd returned to work, he'd returned to cycling, he'd returned to everything that he used to do, but he did it with a level of pain. But that was $350,000 that provided him with a lot of surety if he was unable to work into the future because his back gave out. So I think those things are quite important uh, in relation to the what we've just seen from Nick. So again, um, if you are injured on the roads, you are eligible for medical and like benefits, loss of earnings, permanent impairment, and potentially a pain and suffering and economic loss payment for the future. <clears throat> now, um, unidentified vehicles, these are uh, common, more common for cyclists, I think these types of claims where you have an unidentified vehicle. Property damage claims can't be successful as the vehicle's unidentified because you've got no one to sue. So you don't know who caused the damage. Um, however, an injuries claim can be accepted <clears throat> and will be accepted by the TAC if the injuries are consistent with the type of accident that you're reporting and a police report is made. Sorry for having to drink just to keep my voice under control. Um, <clears throat> again, that requires that you make quick reports. And I think too, just going back to, to cyclists, it's not uncommon for you to be on your bike and for someone, a driver around you to make a sudden movement. They're not even, they didn't see you, but you take evasive action to avoid that vehicle or to avoid another obstacle that that vehicle has now forced you towards. You have an accident, you fall off your bike, um, the vehicle, the vehicle drives on, never stops. Maybe it knew what it did, maybe it didn't. These are really common. And I think quite often cyclists don't identify that the vehicle actually caused the accident. They blame themselves, oh, well, I fell. Those accidents I think are very, very common for cyclists. I think, the, um, um, I think you were saying one in four is a hit and run in a sense, but I'd say there's more than that, that are evasive action type type accidents and those are the ones I think also don't get reported 
And I think people think, well, what's the point in reporting it? I can't do anything about it. From a property damage perspective, absolutely. Unless you get evidence of the vehicle or the driver, you can't. However, if you, if you, um, if you put in a claim with the TAC, you need to do, uh, you need to provide evidence. And the first thing is, I was injured, so I go to my doctor. I report it to the police. I had a near miss here, and it caused this to happen. And you think about, you know, the wording. The wording you want on that police report is, I was almost hit by a vehicle, avoided the vehicle, and had an accident. The TAC will accept that type of claim. And they will then provide you again with the with medical and like benefits, loss of earnings, and potentially a permanent impairment claim. It gets a little bit difficult to prove someone was at fault when we actually can't identify who they were, but it's not impossible, certainly not impossible. I think 18 months ago, I had a, a plaintiff who swerved to avoid a vehicle in the wet who merged onto him. He fell and he injured his dominant arm and he worked in the hospitality management, but it was a very physical role. Um, the vehicle didn't stop. It was, <clears throat> wasn't identified, able to be identified. Witnesses did stop, but they didn't get the number plate. He then was picked up by an ambulance. He told the ambulance, this is what happened. He told witnesses, this is what happened. So we were able to go back and get statements from witnesses. He said, well, I didn't see it, but this is what he said to me when I helped him off the road. And then we were able to get the ambulance notes. This is what he said to the ambulance. Those notes that are from the ambulance are given to the hospital. <clears throat> so they quite often use those notes as the basis for the beginning of the treatment, you know, what happened. He also reported it to the hospital. He couldn't go back to work. He had uh, multiple surgeries on his arm. The arm really was never the same again in that he couldn't work in the way that he used to. And um, he was sacked effectively because he couldn't keep up with the demands of his job. They couldn't find him light duty, so they got rid of him, sadly. So we made a TAC claim. All of his surgeries were paid for. He needed a lot of um, hand therapy that was paid for. Um, and then we were able to be successful in a common law damages claim because the reporting was so clear. Um, it, it really uh, requires that sort of clear chain of evidence to say someone has been consistent. There's nothing inconsistent in the notes that have been taken. The person's story has met, re remained the same from the beginning to the end. And we were able to get him $300,000 for that injury. So it was a really, really good, uh, really, really good result for uh, someone who perhaps may not have actually made a claim if he hadn't known about his, you know, if he hadn't known that it was something that he could do. And I think from Nick's um, data, I think you can see there that there is a real lack of reporting. And I think some of that is because sometimes we don't get, as cyclists, we don't get treated particularly well on the roads. We can get bullied. We are vulnerable. You don't want to put yourself in harm's way. And then quite often when we are injured, we're on the side of the road and it's hard for us to get that evidence together. But again, reporting that someone has swerved, you know, there doesn't need to be contact, that something has occurred on the road that a vehicle has caused an obstruction um, will enable you to uh, make a claim and make a claim that protects you. Um, you know, having your medical really clear from some of the um, data from Nick that, you know, having your medicals paid for makes a huge difference to um, how you recover. If you can't afford the physio that you need, particularly in that critical stage, where your injury is fresh and is able to um, is able to heal quickly, if you're waiting for physio because you can't afford it, that's going to really diminish your capacity to get back to where you were. And, and also with the loss of earnings as well. Without loss of earnings, the amount of stress that people are put under when they're trying to, not only are they physically struggling, but now they're also economically struggling and that makes a huge difference to how they heal as well and how they recover from those injuries. So um, I guess that's where I'd like to leave it at this point. Just also just a little reminder, um, road authority claims, which I know Dimi has talked about, and I think that's on the website as well in one of the earlier uh, webinars, but also it is really important to report faults in the road. Um, 
public liability is not my area. However, I know that um, lots of people have falls, um, uh, come off their bike because there is gravel on the road that shouldn't be there because there are potholes in the road that shouldn't be there. Melbourne has been a sea of uh, building works and roadworks over the last two to three years. There is a lot of obstruction and a lot of badly handled traffic management. So any of those types of occurrences firstly should be reported to the responsible authority. If it's a road traffic management company, that should be reported. If it's a, an issue with the road, that should be reported to the responsible road authority. And I know that um, in terms of property damage, making those reports to uh, road authorities, you can sometimes recover uh, property damage amounts on those reports but they usually have to be above, I think, $1,500 in order to make the claim. One of the reasons for that is the legislation's designed to prevent people from making um, windscreen claims. So that, you know, if they're working on the road and there's gravel on the road and it flicks up and smashes 10 windscreens, they're not liable for those. But um, we are pushing uh, to try and uh, when we do get reports of those to actually push forward on the property damage on those and say, well, cyclists are a different case in point. Um, but yes, if you also, again, it's that thing, if you report a fault and it's continually reported, there's a really clear chain of evidence if someone gets terribly injured at that spot. We've got other people who've said, well, it's a problem and you should have done something about it. So it's really important to put, put, in, those, put in those notices. Um, I think that's where I'm going to leave it tonight. I'm sorry I went through that uh, rather quickly, but I was aware of time. Um, but I'm happy to answer questions at the end. So thank you for that. Thank you, Natalie. That was very insightful. It's always good to uh, to get some clarity on the legal side of things, which can be a little bit of uh, an area where a lot of riders aren't sure about. So we really appreciate your expertise there. Um, I'll now hand over to our final speaker, uh, Damien Stewart, who's going to talk a little bit more about the psychological principles of, of a crash and, and recovering from that. So uh, if you wouldn't mind taking it away, Damien. Thanks, Nick. Um, I guess one of the things I'll say is I do apologise. I don't have a presentation. I sort of got asked at a last moment to, to be involved. So uh, I'll talk a little bit about some of the principles um, that, that I usually work with with people that have been through what we're talking about tonight. Um, I am a sport and exercise psychologist. Um, one of the things I guess I will say about sport and exercise psychology in Australia is we are kind of unique um, compared to the rest of the world where we are trained to work in mental health first and then our, our specialization second. So that can that does put us in a, a place to be able to help um, people that are having mental health issues, um, particularly around a crash or you know one of the places that sports psychs do work a lot with people is, you know, time out, of, time out of sport or time out of play where we're injured or we're, we're unable to play. So it is a place that we are uniquely um, uh, placed to be able to help people that have gone through crashes, for example. Um, also, there is a very vibrant sports psychology network down in Melbourne. I'm actually on the Sunshine Coast um, but um, and the National Chair of the College of Sport and Exercise Psychology. But um, there are a number of very, very good sports psychologists in Melbourne and Victoria that can help anybody who might need some help getting back to play. Um, one of the things I guess I'll start with is, is I actually do work a lot with chronic pain and injury. Uh, a lot of the times, um, you know, certainly people have come off their, their bicycles, but a lot of the time, you know, the other two wheel um, vehicle or motorbikes, as I'm sure uh, Natalie has a lot of experience with as well. Um, so I, I don't, I think it's like, uh, I've worked with some equestrian. I don't think there's anyone I've worked with from equestrian, uh, or, or rides a motorbike or a bike that hasn't had some sort of serious crash at some point. So, um, but I have just come back from Poland in, in Europe and I notice over there, lots and lots of bike lanes, lots and lots of people riding bikes. And there seems to be a lot more of it over there. And I'm not sure, uh, what the statistics are like over there, but the roads seem to be set up a lot better uh, for bi for bi um, cyclists over there in Europe. So I guess one of the first things to talk about when we're talking about having a crash on a bike, you know, Natalie and uh, has, has talked about a lot of different um, types of 
crashes. And of course, there's going to be different variations. It's not going to be the same for everybody. So, you know, we're going to have people that sort of fall off their bike and are able to get back on and, and continue on their journey through to people that are going to end up in hospital, maybe for quite serious injuries. And, uh, and the end result of that could be that some people will be comfortable getting back on their bike. Some people will find it very, very difficult um, I'm for one, one of those uh, statistics that sort of would probably like to ride a bike a little bit more, but too scared of getting knocked off when I, when, if, if I go for a ride. So it is going to be different for everyone. So everything that I'm talking about today, I'm probably leaning more towards the more serious psychological outcomes of coming off a bike and having a crash rather than for people who, you know, sort of had a, a mild crash or even if a serious crash, but it hasn't affected them psychologically. So I'm probably going to focus more on those that are, are more seriously affected. Um, it's probably a couple of different uh, periods to, to think about when we we've had a crash off a, off a bike. And um, one of those is sort of like, uh, you know, like a, a, we we've got our treatment phase and then we've got our, what we call return to play phase, I guess is or return to sport phase as we talk about it. Uh, in the sports psychology industry. So one of the things to think about is, you know, when we're off maybe getting some treatment and we can't get back on the bike, um, probably not, uh, it's not a good time for people, particularly those that are used to being very, very active and people can get into a bit of a rut and a bit of depression, maybe a bit of anxiety, worrying about, well, you know, I'm, I'm used to being so active and I can't do the thing that makes me so active. So what do I do now? And I think that um, you know, if, especially if we can't go back to work and we, if we can't get ourselves involved in what we'll normally get involved in, it's a good time to work on the other type parts of our sport that we might have neglected um, whilst, whilst we're doing so much riding or whilst we're doing, you know, so much work. And that might be working on the mental side of our sport. That might be, um, you know, working on some conditioning that we might need to get stuck into if we can't get onto the bike. But it's also a good time to involve ourselves in other aspects of our life that we might have neglected because we're so, you know, so devoted to our work or so devoted to our writing. So are there relationships that we might have let go or we might need to have neglected that we can spend a bit of time on trying to get back into? Are there hobbies that we've neglected for a while that we might be able to get stuck back into um and you know uh, other other things that 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 we might be interested in or we might want to take up might be time to do a short course or, or something like that that we can do online one of these micro credentials so that's something to have a think about i think it's also a good time to talk about um our treatment regime as well um working in the chronic pain space, there are some things that we need to adhere to. Um, you know, one of the things that's very, very important when we've had an injury is to make sure that we find a treatment team that we trust uh, and that we can get on board with and they're going to get on board with us. You know, uh, I think there's been a, a long time uh, where we've trusted people like myself or doctors or surgeons or physiotherapists where, you know, we sort of just go along and, and yes, sir, no, sir, do whatever you say, sir, where, you know, we want to be part of the treatment team as well as the athlete. You know, we want to know if someone's giving us a, a treatment or want to do a surgery or, um, or, or give us a medication. You know, a lot of people just go along with it. Yeah, okay, but it's okay to ask why. You know, can you explain to me why I'm being asked to do this or why you want to do this surgery or why this medication? Um, you know, get involved. Be part of the treatment team yourself. Don't just be a passive bystander to your own treatment i think it's very very important from that point of view i think that once we've once you know and the other thing i'll say is adhere to your treatment uh team's treatment plan for you as well um if the physiotherapist or the or the surgeon says do three times 10 repetitions do three times 10 repetitions don't do 15 or 20 because that will um, there's a reason why they're telling you three times 10, you know, and doing 12 or doing 15 or doing 20 is not necessarily going to get you back quicker, but might get you back slower. So make sure you adhere to the treatment regime. It's very, very important. And then we start working towards the ret return to sport or return to play or return to riding uh, in your case. And, and Natalie might tell you all, and I'm sure she'd correct me if I'm wrong, but um, you might need a clearance from a doctor to go back if, you, if there's an insurance claim that's involved. So make sure you do get clearances be, before you go back 
um, to sport because if you go back too early and you didn't have a clearance, that could negatively affect any kind of insurance claim uh, that that might be in place. So be very very careful about that. And also we don't we want to make sure that we're not going to re-injure ourselves as well. So you know many many times athletes you know you know I've been an elite athlete myself and uh, you know being on the sidelines is is tantamount to torture. So we want to get back as much as as quickly as we can. But that might keep us off the off the bike even longer if we've tried to return to, to, to riding way, way, way too early. So these are, are very important things to do. It might be worth taking an extra week of not riding uh, to get things right before we get on to save ourselves maybe six months more of not being able to ride or, or re-injuring ourselves. So um, I think that's very, very important. And I do understand that, that we, we are, as athletes we, and, and as active people, we want to get back as quickly as possible, but that's not necessarily the best thing for us a lot of the time. Um, so now I'm starting to going to start to talk more towards, and I am mindful of the time, but I'm going to talk towards uh, getting back on the bike. And I noticed that, that some of the survey showed uh, a lot of people having some reluctance to returning to the bike after a crash. And, you know, that's tantamount to some trauma. We, we, we've, we've probably taken on board some trauma as a result of this crash. It might may or may not be a full diagnosis of PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, but, um, you know, certainly a, a certain amount of anxiety about getting back on the bike because of a, a crash is, is pretty normal um, and also quite, completely understandable. And Natalie will probably be able to talk a little bit more at some point if this happens to you, that you can have a psychological claim as well. And particularly up here in Queensland, if you've had a, um, a physical injury because of a car crash, bike crash, whatever the case may be, a psychological claim and having your psychological appointments paid for by insurance companies can be part of your claim. And that's often where I'm working with people as well. So don't be afraid to, to sort of say I'm struggling a little bit from a psychological point of view, because a psychological injury is an injury as well. So, um, uh, so there's 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 post traumatic stress disorder. There's general experiences of anxiety. Uh, I could go through all the symptoms of that. I'm not sure how deeply we want to go, but if you're having trouble, um, if you're having a lot of anxiety getting back on the bike, you are avoiding the place from which your crash occurred. If you're having um, flashbacks or feel like you're reliving the crash. Um, if you're having nightmares, night sweats, um, difficulty getting to sleep, difficulties with concentration and memory, these are all uh, symptoms of people that are struggling probably, and, and it wasn't there before the crash, it's there after the crash, there's probably some signs that you're having some psychological difficulties with, with the crash that you've um, undertaken. So, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to end up in a psychiatric ward or anything like that, but there's certainly some things that we can do to help you to feel a little bit better and, and, and get back on the bike and get back into life again. So um, generally we want to talk about a graduated return. Once again, I'm talking here to people that might have a specific difficulty getting back on the bike. This doesn't pertain to everybody. If you've regained your, your health and your fitness to get back on the bike and you've got no problems, go for your life. I'm not, I'm not here to try to curtail people. And it is generally the old, adage of you know get back on the horse you know get back on you know get back on the reins get back in the the rider's seat you know so as quickly as possible can help but if we're having trouble doing that there are some some techniques that we can put in place to help you um, to get back on the bike and one of the things that that we find very very you know especially if this is our first serious crash i think up to that point a lot of us think about the bicycle crash is something that happens to other people. That doesn't happen to me. That's what happens to other people. And then once we've had a crash, we're now under the impression that I'm not invulnerable anymore. I am vulnerable. You know, this has happened once. There's every chance it could happen again. But before it happens, it's, that's not part of our experience. So, but we tend to forget that we've ridden our bike a thousand times. And for a thousand times, I didn't have a crash. I didn't have didn't run into that pothole. You know, a car didn't open its door and I ran into it. We kind of forget this thousand times that we rode and it was only once that this happened. But thinking about it in, the, in those terms can be helpful to sort of remember that, well, for the majority of the time that I ride my bike, this doesn't happen. I'm, I'm, I'm not vulnerable most of the time. But 
having a first crash or a second crash can sort of trigger that in me that this is now possible. This can happen to me now. And so we probably want to think about a graduated return to the bike. I mean, if we're used to riding through Melbourne City, you know, through all that traffic at peak hour, that might not be the best place to try to get back on our bike again when we're trying to get this, what we call uh, a graduated return or a graduated exposure um, back to riding. That's what we're trying to do is a graduated exposure. So we, we might, we try to graduate our way back to morning peak hour traffic, for example, if that's what our end goal is. It's probably very important to know what the end goal is that we want to work towards uh, at the whilst we're returning to, to the bike. So how would we put together a graduated return? Well, you know, we might find, you know, if we live in the suburbs, we might find just the quiet streets around where I live to get back on the bike. We might even just before we go to getting back on the road where there's going to be other cars, we might go to a, a bicycle track that doesn't go onto a road. Uh, up the road from where I live at the moment, there's a, it's like a circular ride that's in a park, which is about a one kilometre around. We might ride around that uh, for a couple of weeks until we start to feel comfortable. So we might want to, as we're doing this graduated exposure, we want to take it, say if we, my first step is to go on a track that's off the road, well, we might still have a little bit of anxiety about that, but we're able to do it. So we probably want to do that until such time as we're not feeling any anxiety about getting back on the bike. And then we graduate again to a quiet street where there's not many cars or no cars at all or at a quiet time of the day. And we ride around there until such time as we're not feeling any anxiety. It might be a week, might be two weeks uh, until we, we can comfortably get back on the bike with no anxiety. Then we might try to go on a, a, a lightly busy road until such time as we feel comfortable and there's little anxiety. And then we might go to a medium density and then maybe a high density road or a highly busy road. So we're trying to do this graduated return over a period of time, which might take a month or two to, to get back um, and comfortable again. So, so the principles of getting back onto the bike are very much about, uh, you know, especially if we're having some difficulty with it, we don't have to throw ourselves back into the deep end straight away. You know, try in the the shallow pool or the shallow end of the pool or go in the kiddies pool as as, as I might want to use the, the vernacular, right? Before we get back onto the deep end of the pool where we can't touch the bottom, um, if, if that uh, analogy rings true for you all. So that's basically how we do that. The other thing is, you know, there are many, um, the, the biggest thing that we can learn to help us with our anxiety and getting us back onto the road is using some some relaxation techniques, stuff around deep breathing, diaphragmatic breathing. I mean, on my website, I'm, I'm not sure if it's been shared or I can definitely share it. There is a video on learning how to do diaphragmatic breathing and some other anxiety management techniques on there. But there are plenty of resources. There are plenty of apps that can help us with those sort of things. And, and generally, if we're feeling anxiety getting on the bike, doing some deep breathing before we get on there, uh, regulating our breathing while we're riding. These can be very, very helpful for, ang for anxiety. So that's probably what most of us are going to be experiencing getting on a bike. And remember that anxiety is always future oriented. We're worrying about something happening. It's not about necessarily getting back on the bike that creates the anxiety. It's what could happen when I get back on the bike that creates the anxiety. So that's always future oriented. So the more I can bring myself back into the present moment, everybody's probably heard of the term of, of mindfulness, which the mindfulness is about being in the here and now, not in the future, not in the past about, about what's happened. So if we can use processes to keep us in the present moment, diaphragmatic breathing, mindfulness techniques, that's going to be um, very, very helpful. And the other thing that I generally find with people, which is not well thought of, is a lot of the anxiety is not even necessarily getting back on the bike. And it's not necessarily even about having a crash. It's about going through everything I had to go through because I had the crash. I had to go and have a sur I had to go and have surgery. I couldn't go to work. I couldn't pick up my children. I don't want to go through having all those needles and that plaster again. So that's a lot of what it's about. So once again, coming back to riding, you know, there is the the breathing, there is the um, the uh, anxiety and relaxation techniques that we can employ. But there's also, if I'm working with any athlete um, that's coming back from an injury, we can always be focused on 
what can go wrong, what can go wrong, what can go wrong. But what I try to encourage athletes to do is, is have that mindfulness, but focus on the processes of my sport. So if I'm focused on the process of riding my bike, it's I'm far less, I'm, I'm far more focused on what I can control rather than what I can't control. So, you know, I, I'm an AFL fan. Most people in Melbourne are probably AFL fans. I'm from Perth originally, big Dockers fan. Um, but, you know, we'll, we'll hear about uh, athletes talking about all the time, you know, I can only control what I can control. And this is what they're talking about. You know, if I'm, if I'm lining up for goal to kick a goal and I'm worried about what the score is, I'm not going to be focused on the process I need to go through to strike the ball correctly so it goes through the goals. And it's the same when I'm riding. If I'm distracted by all the cars around me, I might miss the car door that's opened in front of me. I might miss, uh, you know, a pothole in the road. I want to be focused on what it takes to be a good rider. And you guys are all the experts on, on riding a bike. What are the processes that I need to focus on to ride a bike? Left foot, right foot, left foot, right foot, cadence, all these sort of things focused out there. Where's my goal? You know, I'm looking to the next power pole and then the next power pole and the next power pole, these sort of things. So, you know, getting back to focusing on the process of riding a bike rather than what could go wrong these are all very good techniques for getting our mind focused back on riding so we can get back on the bike uh, effectively and comfortably so we can get back to enjoying our sport. So uh, with that in mind, hopefully I've covered very, very quickly some of the psychological processes of what goes into um, having a crash, having an injury, maybe having some pain and how we might get back on the bike and getting back to what we love afterwards and absolutely happy to um, provide an email address and answer any questions people might have or point you in the direction of psychologists in Melbourne, um, but also to answer any questions tonight uh, before we finish. Awesome. Thank you very much, Damien. That was uh, some really interesting insights and techniques and things I hadn't really thought about that I, I think um, our the people watching will find really interesting and we'll certainly uh, distribute the contact details uh, post webinar. So if anyone has any any further questions to reach out privately, but we, we have had a few questions come through. And I am conscious we're running a little bit over time. So I'm sorry about that folks, but I might just touch on a few of these questions and direct them at our panel members and hopefully they can uh, provide some insights. So one good question came through Nick um, about uh, the, the study sort of highlighted that driver education was one of the, uh, the the key things that people who were involved in incidents thought might help reduce the crashes in, in future. Um, in your opinion or uh, from your perspective, what, what can we do to improve driver education? Yeah, that's a, a very good, very logical question. Um, I think um, from the lens of advocacy, uh, I mean, speaking on behalf of obviously of Bicycle Network, I think it's quite simple. It's it's talking and campaigning. Um, it's going out and talking to, for example, our road authorities, uh, motoring clubs, RACB, RACQ, etc. Um, TAC, uh, the, the Safer Australian Roads and, and Highways Group, Sarah, uh, would be a, a key bodies that we need to go uh, and present the data to and 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 talk through solutions. Uh, I think that's uh, I think that's the the, the simple um, and most impactful mechanism uh, for. For really driving that um, but I think uh, things that we could do on top of that um, to, to make that stronger is certainly having a good coalition of people that um, that support that um, for example other other bike groups that are um, that are involved in, in the uh, in the safety space um, and also a, a strong sense of, of community and, and, and public support um, I think is extremely important as well. But I think really it is it is talking, it is communicating um, and finding solutions through that mix. And I think we have a very good uh, data set here with some very impactful findings that will hopefully um, drive that message pretty strongly. Yeah, thanks, Nick. And on that point, and feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, would you say that's sort of one of the reasons why um, we've sort of, you sort of stressed throughout this presentation, the importance of reporting, because like you said, there's so much of this that goes unreported. And I suppose in terms of trying to prevent something from happening, the best thing we can do is, is fully understand it, which is what Nick's work in this survey and all of the uh, respondents um, have really provided that insight. And now it's about taking that data and seeing how exactly we can implement that, whether it's 
driver safety or whether it's infrastructure and stuff like that. So just to stress again how important it is to actually report on these issues, and even if you if you may not uh, be inclined to initially, because that is really helpful. Um, we had another question come through uh, for Natalie. Natalie, um, there was a question stating, uh, will TAC get involved with rider-only accidents? For example, accidents caused by hitting trams, tracks, or potholes? No, no. So the TAC is a statutory-based scheme uh, that uh, is based on ensuring uh, registered vehicles. So they take their funds from the registration pool um, and that's the, the aim of the that's the aim of the scheme is to protect us on the roads from a, uh, from actions that occur as a result of drivers of registered vehicles. Okay, so that that won't they, they won't be interested in in following up on that. It's sort of fulfilling the aims of the scheme at this point. I understand the frustration for anyone who's gone over on tram tracks or um, a pothole, etc. But they they fall outside of the fall outside of the scheme. It has to be a road accident involving a motor vehicle. No, thank you for clarifying that, Natalie. It is a, sort of a, a common question that we have. And, and again, it sort of comes back to the, um, the importance of reporting. Like Nick mentioned at the start, we do have the portal on the website to report these things. And, and we do recommend, obviously, Bicycle Network members, if you, have a, if you do have a crash, whether or not um, it is a rider-only crash or you're looking to make a claim to the TAC, please, as, as a Bicycle Network member, we will... Um, offer you a free consultation with free initial consultation with Morris Blackburn, but we'll also take that data and it'll help inform Nick's work moving forward and, and our team's work moving forward and the entire bike riding community needs uh, is start structuring their advocacy moving forward. So there is sort of an underlying theme here of the importance of, of reporting. Um, we had another question come through. Oh, just had one question come through there. I'm just sort of scrolling through these, but one question I had I thought was interesting, Nick, and Damien sort of touched on this in his presentation as well, is I don't know if you know the, the answer off the top of your head, but how do these stats sort of compare uh, to what we see overseas in, in, other, in other countries? Yeah, that's, um, yeah, it, it's a good question. And um, yeah, incidentally, um, I should say that part of the motivations for, for, for doing this uh, particular study in Australia um, came from some similar work that had been done in, in Ireland, actually, through um, Trinity College in Dublin. So uh, some researchers had actually put together a very similar um, survey structure to the one that we have used uh, here. And uh, perhaps unsurprisingly found very similar results. They found a, a, a very significant underreporting of crashes um, that seemed to be inconsistent with uh, the crash statistics. Uh, in Ireland, I think in Ireland, I'm not sure if it was specifically within Dublin, but um, it's certainly, you know, within the uh, Irish, within Ireland. Um, so I think that is quite telling that there could be a widespread underrepresentation of, um, of crashes amongst our traditional forms of collecting crash statistical data. Interesting stuff. Thank, thanks for that, Nick. Um, Look, I think for now, we're, we've run a little bit over time and uh, we've had a, I, I've really enjoyed the presentation. Thank you very much to the, uh, each presenter for your own uh, unique insights. And again, just to echo Nick, Nick's words at the start of the presentation, thank you, of course, to the people here tonight who, uh, pretend, f f first of all, for your time, but also uh, who potentially participated in the survey itself and helped inform this data because it is, uh, it is an important part of advocacy is uh, understanding uh, the issue at hand. So uh, again, I'd just like to thank uh, Dr. Hunter from Bicycle Network, as well as Natalie from Morris Blackburn and Damien from Room 23 Psychology. Thank you very much for your time this evening. And of course, thank you to all of our participants who, uh, who joined us this evening. And thank you for the questions that came through as well. Uh, we'll be in touch as we continue to uh, pull together this report based off our survey. And, uh, and uh, please, Keep in touch as we uh, as we move forward with this work. It's very important to all of us. So, thank you everyone for joining us this evening, and uh, I hope you have a good night. We'll see you next time. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Thanks.